Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Subway Summit webinar series, COVID-19 Lessons Learned from the Epicenter. My name is David Muller. I'm Dean for Medical Education at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, and I'm here to co-moderate this session with Jeff Young from the AAMC. We are actually not going to talk about the Epicenter today. We're going to talk about America and medical education and racism, and we are very, very proud to be able to add this session to the week's webinar series and to have you participate with us on a Friday evening. We want to shout out quickly to all of the schools in New York and New Jersey who have participated, presented, um, helped organize and plan this session. And in particular, we want to say our deepest thanks to um, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation for supporting us, for the AAMC and AMSNY for co-sponsoring this session. Um, you will see, and you've seen this before, if you participated earlier in the week, these are the summit objectives. I will add to this that we find ourselves at a historic moment in time today. Um, we're going to make history this evening, I think, because by the time the session is over, many of us will have made a life-altering decision. And that decision will be that eliminating racism and bias is our top priority as medical educators and medical administrators. Nothing else is more important, and everything we do must be done through that lens. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Jeff Young. Thank you, uh, David, and um, good evening. I, um, my name is Jeffrey Young, and I'm the Senior Director for Student Affairs uh, at the, and Programs at the Association of American Medical Colleges. And I also want to extend my welcome to you to this Subway uh, Summit special webinar session uh, entitled Racism, American Medicine's Fatal Flaw. I want to thank uh, Drs. Tara Cunningham, Leona Hess, and David Mueller for their leadership in putting together this summit, as well as the schools who have shared their experience with us this week. My role this evening, as David indicated, is, is to co-moderate, um, and more specifically, I'm going to just share a few opening comments uh, to hopefully try to frame um, our discussion this evening. To allow as much time as possible to uh, uh, this evening's topic, uh, we're not going to do a, like a formal introduction to our colleagues this evening, but all that information has been provided to you ahead of time. So I would really encourage you to, to do so. So before I, I start, um, I just really want to acknowledge the lives that were taken violently within the past few months, including Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and most recently, George Floyd. I also want to honor those men, women, and children who have been murdered throughout the history of this country because of the color of their skin and systemic racism. And I want to emphasize that this also includes our Native Americans, um, those indigenous people that inhabited this country long before uh, Europeans came. I also just want to acknowledge, I really don't believe that I've really expressed uh, in a very public form my experiences with racism, but given the opportunity to do so this evening and the events that have been happening in this country more recently really compelled me to, to do so. Next slide, please. What you see here is a, a picture of my family. Uh, to the left uh, is my mother and my father on their wedding day. This past uh, June 4th, they, they've been married 69 years. And I just want to share what, what their experiences are. And, and my mother is 89. She probably wouldn't want me saying that publicly. And my father's 96. So I just want to share that my mother was raised in the segregated South. And my father was raised in a segregated community in the Northeast because his family was dirt poor. Um, my parents lived through Jim Crow, the civil rights movement, the assassinations of Kennedy, King, and Malcolm. So I grew up in a home where my parents, aunts and uncles, and that's, that's the other slide there, um, that talked about the realities of being Black in this country. They talked about their limited and unfair uh, access to separate but equal education, housing, and they also shared the history and the risk of being murdered by the police or others who felt that they had the right to brutalize and terminate a black life by lynching or other violence. 
they frame this reality and vulnerability within the context of racism. I think it's also really important to share that they also talked about and modeled perseverance, resilience, and courage. My parents always said, stand up for what you believe in. They also stressed the importance of integrity and education and taught me and my brother and sisters how to navigate and negotiate being black in America. I'm the youngest of four siblings that, that grew up in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn in the 60s. And then we subsequently moved to New Jersey, which were the suburbs. It was a, it was a culture shock for me. And during that time, I learned that as a black male, I lived in two worlds, one black and one white and that I was vulnerable when interacting with white America. I learned that very young. So it was a risk riding while, you know, riding my bicycle while black, driving while black, walking while black, working while black, filling the gap while black. So my point is that what's occurring in 2020 right now is not a new experience. It's not a new event. White privilege and entitlement are not new. Remember that Emmett Till was murdered in 1955 for allegedly making verbal and physical advances toward a white woman. Years later, this same woman admitted that she lied and the two men who killed Emmett confessed after the fact knowing that they could not be retried for murder because of double jeopardy. Most recently, Amy Cooper in uh, the park cried wolf that could have yielded a negative outcome for Kristen Cooper. So what's new? I say technology is new and we're capturing acts of violence and placing it on social media. Next slide, please. These are my children. These are the love of my life. And this picture was taken last year uh, at my younger son's graduation from high school. He's the one in the middle, obviously. But my current pain and anxiety stems from the hurt, frustration, anger, and sense of vulnerability and helplessness being expressed my, by my children. They're all young adults. And again, as you can see, two, two sons and a daughter. My wife and I have given them the talk. I mean, again, the talk throughout their lives. Um, and they have now experienced and or witnessed the deaths of Trayvon Martin through George Floyd. And the thing that I think that resonates with me and pains me the most is one, despite all of our best efforts, we can't protect my children because they're black and they're vulnerable. And to hear them in essence say, you mean I can do everything right, again, whatever that means, and still be victimized and or killed by others because of the color of my skin. So as our children live their daily lives, my wife and I have instilled in them, again, done our best to instill the things that my family, my parents instilled. Perseverance, resilience, courage, integrity, the importance of education. And whenever they leave our home, my wife and I will always remind them about using their collective Black consciousness, which might, maybe, possibly, keep them safe, but we know there's no guarantee. So I really, I really want to emphasize that this is not an intellectual exercise for, for us. And I would say for many people of color, more specifically, I would say to you that it represents life and death for black and brown people. White privilege and entitlement are symptoms of systemic racism. Racism is found in disparities regarding wealth, income, 
criminal justice. Just look at the mass incarceration of black and brown people. Employment, housing, health care, and education. Those are just some of the more significant factors. So I want to propose to anyone that thinks that the system is broken. I would say, no, the system's not broken. It operates exactly how it's designed to work. So I want to just say that the recent global protests leaves me feeling more hopeful that this country will engage in transformative policy change to address inequality that hopefully will minimize and maybe one day eliminate racism. So I hope today's topic and the presentations and the conversations that it generates will move us one step closer to addressing the pandemic called racism. So with that, I'm going to pass this to my colleague, Dr. Mueller. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm humbled, honestly, by your words and the eloquence of what you have um, shared with everyone. I really don't feel like I have the right to follow that. And yet at the same time, you and I have talked about the importance of black voices and white voices speaking out um, on these issues. So I'm going to do something um, that really reflects on the degree to which language matters. Um, I do not claim to be um, an export or an expert or even nearly as knowledgeable as I need to be about the language that we use. But I think that we have to, in medical education, get used to saying the words, and we need to talk about what these words mean. So what I have on the slides that I hope people read along with me um, is not, these are not the definitions. But racism means two things. It means looking at the world through a biased race-based lens, which we all do unconsciously and consciously. And it means imposing that view on others, specifically on people of color. If you're human, you are hardwired to have biases. And if you're white in America, like me, you have always had the ability to impose your view on others, even if you don't mean to. And that is linked in our minds directly to white supremacy. Being white or whiteness reigns supreme in this country. We are the mainstream. We have the final say, we call the shots, and historically we have perpetuated systems in society and medical practice and biomedical research, you name it, that have harmed and even killed lots of people of color. Systemic racism, means that all of us white people passively accept and therefore perpetuate the status quo, the systems, the structures, the mental models, the institutional values that make up our personal and professional lives. That status quo is by definition racist, as we said before in the last slide. It is systemically racist. And the only alternative is to be anti-racist. To be white and anti-racist requires superhuman effort. It means that everything you do, you, the medical educators out there, every policy decision, every curricular change, every method of evaluation, every admissions decision and financial aid disbursement, every letter of recommendation, everything is actively undoing racism. That's what it means to be anti-racist if you're white. It's not like a fish swimming upstream. It's like a fish rejecting the water it's always lived in and trying somehow to walk around on dry land. So having shared those words, we want to um, have you participate and do something a little interactive using slido.com. Hopefully you have used it before. You can enter slido.com, the URL, um, and hashtag summit as the password. And we want to know right now, in this moment, on a scale of one to tell, how hopeful do you feel? If one is hopeless and 10 is extremely hopeful, where is our audience? Feel free to insert your answers and we'll wait and see how things shake out. Slido.com, hashtag summit. Tell us where you're at. So this is where we're skewed. It's a pretty scary distribution, folks. Pretty scary. Some of us are willing to feel maybe a little bit of hope, um, but there's way, way, way too much to the left. We're going to use the Slido function um, to also allow you to propose questions, to pose questions to the speakers, even as we're speaking. 
Um, and at the end, we will start to run through the questions in the Q&A. When you pose a question on slido.com, um, if it's a question that's specifically targeted to a particular speaker, please put their name in your question. If not, I will pose the question as a facilitator to all of the speakers. So thank, thank you for participating in this section. Um, remember slido.com hashtag summit. And we are gonna start with Denise Rojas Marquez and her talk. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so I'm so honored to be here today. Thank you for inviting me um, and just honored to be in this panel with so many extraordinary people. Um, so my talk today will be on coalition building among black and immigrant communities in COVID-19 and, and um, in this era where we are trying to raise awareness of um, efforts around anti-racism and be in solidarity with black communities. Um, so I do want to start by pointing out that um, I am not joining as someone who identifies as black. Um, I am strongly identified as an immigrant, as a Latina, um, and someone from an oppressed group in this country and in this society. And the main purpose um, is trying to understand and, and hopefully share some insight into what I thought about how to build bridges among people who feel marginalized or oppressed um, and, and the Black community. So it doesn't have to particularly be immigrant communities. Um, this is just something that has been on my mind. So first to share a little bit about myself. Um, I arrived to the United States in 1990, exactly 30 years ago with my family, my sister, my brother, my mother and my father. I was less than one year old when, when I came and my parents, like so many others, arrived to the United States looking for economic and social stability. Being undocumented in the US has shaped nearly every aspect of my life, both big and small ways. When I was six years old, I remember, for example, going to San Francisco and my family had been working on um, trying to adjust our immigration status and I was getting fingerprints for, for some of the paperwork and, and looking so curiously at, at the ink drawing on my fingertips. Um, I also remember being young and seeing the tears in my mother's eyes when she was talking to my grandmother over the phone and, and she was ill in Mexico. And there was so much grief that my, my mother couldn't go back and, and be with my grandmother. So the sense of um, longing and not being able to be with loved ones has been with me for as long as I can remember and, and has actually defined in some ways what it has meant for me to be undocumented as um, now I'm, I'm separated from my family um, and I'll share a little bit. So as I grew older, in addition to the sense of family separation, um, being undocumented also meant that I wasn't able to drive or seek employment, financial aid, or even do something as small as watching an, a, a rated R movie for lack of an ID. I hated the idea of turning 21 because that meant lying to every single one of my friends why I couldn't go to the bar or go dancing. And that's what I just about did for 22 years of my life. Lie after lie, making excuses after excuse for why I was different. So I've been thinking hard these days for what has kept me going during these moments. Um, when immigration officials came into my house, one cold early morning and separated me from my family. I didn't know anyone else in my situation growing up. I felt alone and I also leaned heavily on African-American literature. Maya Angelou, Langston Hughes, Toni Morrison, they were my idols and their words spoke to me and made me feel visible. And I carried them with me during those dark times. One of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou um, is from her poem, I know, I know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And the ex, um, I'll read a sentence that I really carried with me. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown and longed for still, and his tune is heard on a distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. I felt that my wings were clipped as undocumented, that my feet were tied and that I was caged but I did have a voice and, and that literature um, helped me understand that, that I 
could be as loud as, as I could be. And, and so I broke my silence in the hopes that others would hear me and help me. And so long story short, I started a national organization called Pre-Health Dreamers, where we support over a hundred or over a thousand undocumented youth in um, nearly every state in the country, individuals who are pursuing careers in, in the health professions. Um, some of the things that we do are providing one-on-one -on -one advising, resources and advocacy for our members. Um, some of the, the most exciting things that we've done are sponsoring several state, le le state level legislation, including SB 1139 in California, which prohibits medical schools from denying admission to an applicant solely based on their immigration status. These efforts have been extraordinarily difficult. I, throughout all my life, I've heard racial slurs, I've heard, I've been told by lawyers that I should leave this country because I would never amount to much in the United States. I am physically, emotionally, and mentally drained. So I, I definitely identify with, um, you know, the, the, the ones and twos on, on the Slido. And, and sometimes I think that waking up and just existing seems to take up all my energy sometimes in a world that constantly attacks people of color. The fact that I have to ask myself, for instance, how likely is it that I'll be deported today, this month, this year, um, is exhausting. And so I, I, I wonder how many people identify with this, feeling tired, um, spending all of your energy, um, and possibly your entire lifetime fighting for a cause for people who feel oppressed. Um, and this work is hard and it is draining. So first and foremost, it starts with taking care of ourselves. It starts with seeking professional help, prioritizing our loved ones, taking time to rest. I won't talk much more about this point, but I, I think it needs to be said out loud um, because so many of us work in with and for oppressed communities um, and, and it takes such an emotional toll that we, we need to emphasize our own self-care. And secondly, it also starts with creating visibility of the intersectionality of black communities and other oppressed groups. So for instance, I've been thinking about the ways that the immigrant community has been successful because of the lessons of black community leaders, black artists, writers, black young students like John Lewis um, with the SNCC organization who were so brave to organize and risk their lives their, li their lessons in the 1960s, um, such as having peaceful protests, challenging segregation through interstate buses, freedom riders, these tactics have all been borrowed in modern day struggle for immigrants right immigrant rights. Another example is Brown versus Board of Education, which established that racial segregation in schools are unconstitutional. And without that decision, many of us would continue to attend um, lower performing schools or institutions because of the color of our skin. Unfortunately, we know that that is continues to be the case um, even with this legislation. It was Martin Luther King whose I Have a Dream speech inspired so many immigrants, including myself as a high school student to say, I too have a dream. I dare to say, maybe I too am American. And I was inspired by his words that I, I actually wrote my entire college essay to UC Berkeley um, about this dream. My dream is undocumented. The stories of black and other oppressed groups in this society are intertwined. That is something to remember to, that it is important for us to make visible um, and to say this out loud because it's not about them versus us, um, even within oppressed groups. If we, if we get a win for the black community, it shouldn't be a setback for the immigrant community or other communities. It shouldn't be, you know, first is your turn and then is your turn. Additionally, it's important to raise awareness about how black communities are impacted in different spaces that may not often be thought about. So for instance, many black immigrants are individual, it are, many black individuals are immigrants too. And this fact is often obscured because the media has portrayed one narrative about the immigrants or immigrant communities as largely Latino and, and um, from Mexico. Um, 
it is shocking to know that 7% of non-US citizens are black, but they actually make up 20% of those facing deportation. And at Pre-Hill Dreamers, uh, which serves hundreds of students who identify as black and undocumented. And in this moment, this community is at risk of suffering another large blow. The Supreme Court may make a decision, any, well, will make a decision any day now about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program in 2012, which provides temporary protection from deportation um, to these individuals, including myself. And if the Supreme Court strikes down this program, literally thousands of black and undocumented individuals will be at risk for deportation. So this is something that I've, I've thought a lot about is my own need to raise my own voice about um, the, the black and immigrant community. And I urge everyone to think about the intersectionality um, in, in their own spaces. <laughs> So there is no doubt that the same systems that oppress black communities are also the ones that are oppressing other vulnerable communities and that these systems um, influence all oppressed communities. And, and we know, for example, that the black, that anti-blackness is very pervasive in the Latino community. For instance, in, in many cases, having lighter skin is a sign of social status. And there are even beauty products to help lighten one's skin. And so we have to have these hard conversations within immigrant communities and other oppressed communities to recognize how anti-Blackness perpetuates in our own communities. And lastly, the, the big question is, how can we reshape and reframe systems that divide us? Can our liberations be one and the same? And this has to be the case. I firmly believe that it is the only way that we'll be able to achieve freedom and equity. I'll leave with one example that I've recently thought about. As I've been doing advocacy, um, I've been drafting medical advocacy letters for immigration attorneys. So these letters are for individuals who are currently detained in immigration facilities with serious medical conditions. And that um, this work is also under, under the supervision of an attending, and the hope is that these letters can make the case for why these individuals sh should be released immediately or risk imminent death. And as I was writing these letters, I realized how um, it is so hard to find s statistics on detention facilities, for instance, on the spread of disease like TB. And so I was actually able to find significant data on the prison population and the spread of disease in this setting. And using this information, I was able to make a strong case for a client to be released. He was eventually released two weeks ago. Extraordinary, extraordinarily proud of this. So this also helped me understand working together, our efforts multiply. And it's not about adding another burden for folks who are already working with and alongside oppressed communities but maybe as, as Lila Watson said, your liberation is bound to mine and we will achieve by freedom by working together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise, for your remarks and for your inspiring work in coalition building. Uh, next up is Dr. Otibe Sien, who will talk to us about the intersection of racism and COVID-19. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much to Dr. Mueller and the organizers for putting together this amazing summit. Um, so I am a proud New Yorker, also a proud Brooklynite like Dr. Young. Um, I'm now based in Pittsburgh, but I did my medical school training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So I'm really uh, honored to be able to present to you all today and share with you on this important topic, the structural drivers of health disparities in COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. So we've all seen the headlines um, from Chicago to New York City, um, from New Orleans to Los Angeles. And I don't think it's a surprise to any of us that racial and ethnic minorities, in particular Black Americans, are being infected, being hospitalized, and dying at far higher rates from COVID-19 than any of our racial and ethnic uh, minority, or minority or majority counterparts. And as you can see from this slide put together by the American Public Media Research Lab published just earlier this week, is just the latest to show the disproportionate toll that this disease is taking on Black Americans. As you can see from the bar graphs here, with Black 
individuals experiencing death at th nearly three times the rate um, of white Americans from COVID-19. I think these data in particular just have made this current moment as it's been being described so difficult for many of us um, Black Americans, professionals or not, um, to deal with the pain and violence that we've been experiencing over the last few weeks in particular. Next slide, please. So the reasons for the COVID-19 disparities are, are quite broad. And as I've been thinking about this new virus in the using the old framework or the old lens of racial disparities, I've decided to place it into two big buckets. So the first being risk and the second being access. So in the risk bucket, we have the problems of clinical risk factors and social risk factors. And when we think about the clinical risk factors, we look back to the first reports that came out of China and Italy that clearly showed that hypertension, diabetes, obesity, chronic pulmonary diseases such as asthma were some of the key clinical mor comorbidities and drivers that place individuals at higher risk of severe infection and death from COVID-19. Unfortunately, as we also likely know, each of these conditions are far more common in minority groups in our country. We know that Black Americans near, are nearly at about 40% of um, that group have hypertension. We know Black and Hispanic Americans experience nearly double the prevalence of diabetes than their white counterparts. And that Black children are nearly three times more likely to die from asthma in the US. So that clinical risk factors bucket is a pretty significant one as we've been thinking about COVID-19 disparities. However, in the social risk factors um, section of this risk bus bucket, I would argue is actually the most important driver of the health disparities we're experiencing today. We know that racial minorities make up a higher proportion of the essential workers who did not have the privilege of social distancing over the last few months and continue to ride crowded public transportation, subways or buses to get to work. We know that racist housing policies from redlining to restricted covenants to zoning laws, along with decades of racial segregation and violence that moved Black Americans up, up north from the south have resulted in higher rates of minorities residing not only in high density buildings across our city, in particular New York, but also more highly polluted neighborhoods all across the country. And so thinking about those social factors, some of which are displayed in this figure to the right on your screen here is really qu quite important in this moment. So if we talked about the risk bucket and the access bucket. I like to first think about this issue of testing, which till today, three months into the pandemic, remains such a critical need that we have in the country. While we're at this exciting time of nearly 400 to 500,000 tests performed every day, racial and ethnic minorities continue to have limited access to such testing. We're experiencing the challenges of accessing drive-through testing uh, due to poor car ownership in our racial ethnic minority groups. We know that data from Texas, from Chicago as well, have shown that the availability of public testing sites is much lower in predominantly minority groups and in predominantly urban environments as well. And all of this is on top of the fact that there remains over 27 million Americans who are uninsured in our country, the, most of, um, the largest proportion of which are Black and Hispanic. And furthermore, we know that federally qualified health clinics and community health centers which have been charged with caring for the uninsured and the vulnerable populations in our country, have had to shutter their doors over the last few months due to social distancing policies and the urgent need to address COVID-19 in the acute um, setting inside the hospitals. So as we um, go from kind of risk, clinical risk factors, the social risk factors to testing, we also know that access to treatment Unfortunately, either from anecdotes or from the data that are slowly starting to come out um, are also born with disparities. And we know that those disparities exist from that first initial presentation to the emergency department where their patient's symptoms are actually triggering the COVID-19 testing process, 
all the way through to what happens in the intensive care unit and whether um, minority patients in particular are receiving the highest quality care, whether it's ventilators that are required for the severe um, causes or complications of this disease, or even palliative care to help patients and their families decide what should be happening at the end of life. So again, all across the, the, um, the co continuum rather of COVID-19, I think we should all be thinking about the disparities that exist and how the structural factors in particular really drive those disparities. Also in the figure, which I, don't, I didn't mention, we really need to pay attention to discrimination, which we um, heard from Denise, her story in, in that regard. Unemployment, which makes us think about the um, challenges that the post-COVID era is going to bear and the 40 million Americans who are now experiencing unemployment, the majority, again, of whom happen to be come from Black and Hispanic groups in our country. And then the cultural um, issue, that kind of last bottom um, figure there and how uh, vulnerable Americans, in particular non-English speaking Americans, are gaining access to critical public health information related to mask wearing, social distancing, and, and, um, um, and being able to stay safe in their homes as well. Next slide, please. So along with the two broad buckets of risk and access, I think it's particularly important for us to pay attention to three critical structural drivers that continue to place vulnerable Americans at high risk today. The first being incarceration, which we know that again, black individuals are incarcerated at five times the rate of white individuals in state prisons in our country. And we've seen the news reports of several outbreaks in prisons, including in New York City paying attention to our immigrant populations, which we just heard about, in particular, the over 7 million undocumented immigrants in our country, uh, many of whom over the, spent the last four years fearing not just whether they will be deported from the country, but actually engaging with the healthcare system, which has limited their ability to be able to, quote unquote, ask their doctor about their symptoms, which was the party line that so many public health officials were giving at the start of this crisis not to mention potential fears of actually showing up in the clinic to get COVID-19 testing. And lastly, the homeless population, who for weeks we saw scenes of sleeping in parking lots, and it took nearly a social movement, as many movements tend to be, to actually draw change to bring those individuals into the hotels that they needed to receive care from. Next slide and final slide, please. So as we think about the post-COVID era, and this was, slide was supposed to show up a little bit more uh, piecemeal, but I think these are just some of the few headlines that um, our news reporter and journalist colleagues have shown us. The idea that essential workers um, are a vulnerable population that we need to continue to think about. The idea that access to testing is not um, guaranteed and that there still is a unique group of Americans who don't have such access. And that once our patients actually get into um, the healthcare system, how do we think about their care? Again, from their presentation in the emergency department all the way through to that final breath in intensive care unit. So we have the tools to do better. We have history on our side and I appreciate all your time for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Essien, for your great presentation and for signing such a stark light <clears throat> on the most recent way that this country and frankly our profession has failed communities of color. Um, Next up is Lashira Nolan, who will talk about the importance of anti-racism training in medical education curricula. Yeah, um, first I just wanna say thank you all for having me here today. It's been so inspiring to hear the thoughts of the two speakers before me. I look up to both of you um, in, in different ways um, and, I, and I thank you for your thoughts and, and for bringing that to our attention. Um, so today, what I want to talk about um, is the case for anti-racism training in medical education. And the reason why I really want to bring this to light is we've seen the protests, we've seen the disparities, and we're having these conversations. But now I think it's time for us to consider how can we start to implement all of these different things that we're discussing, these changes that we want to make into medical education, because we've had plenty of opportunities before, but they've been missed. So the way that I framed my talk today is by bringing up five particular points in, in five particular issues in how we are not addressing racism in medical education. Next slide, please. So the first question that we're probably asking ourselves is why has unconscious bias training failed? 
Um, I took an unconscious bias training um, the first month of medical school, I'm sure many of us have done various unconscious bias trainings, whether it was for work or for academic purposes. And the reason why I personally never felt that unconscious bias trainings were effective is because all they really do is tell you that you have these biases and that we act based on these biases. But we never talk about how when we overlay the fact that some of us, ha some of us have positions of power in our society and we benefit from those positions in our society, how our biases can actually perpetuate harm because of the power structures that we have in our society. So I think that that is really what the core of anti-racism training is. It's not just saying, hey, we all have biases, but it's that some of us have particular privileges and power in our society. And when we act on these biases, they can be very harmful, violent, and dangerous to certain communities. Next slide, please. Um, so the first, thing that I want to bring up um, is the representation issue. And the first time that I experienced this as a medical student is when we were in class learning about Lyme disease. And at this point, we were in class for maybe two months learning about various different diseases and how they pre present on the skin. And this image came up when we were talking about Lyme disease. And a student in the class raised their hand and said, hey, how would I recognize this bullseye rash in a patient with darker skin? And the professor really didn't know how to answer that question. He just said, it's a little bit more difficult to see. And he just kind of moved on to the next slide. And I found that to be the case over and over again in medical education. Because also when we learned to do CPR, all of the mannequins that we learned on were white. And then additionally, when we learned anatomy, all the images that we were shown were of people with white skin. And while this might not seem like a big deal to some, it really does make a big difference because whether we realize it or not, we're sending implicit and quite explicit messages as well that white skin is the standard and that is going to be the patient that we're going to serve. But we know that that's not true. As the United States becomes more diverse, it's important or it should have been important years ago, but it's important now more than ever that we know how to recognize all different types of diseases and how they present on different skin types. And I think that this also plays into the reason why we have some residents and some medical students who think that black people have thicker skin or that black people don't feel pain because we've made the standard for care the white patient. So therefore, when we go out into the world, we don't know how to interface with black patients. And, these, and that's because of the subtle messages that we have ingrained in, in medical education. So now going on to the second issue. Next slide, please. So Dr. Tibay just showed us various different um, disparities with COVID-19. And I think that the way that we were presented statistics about COVID-19 is so emblematic of how we're often presented data in medical education. So often, for example, if we're in class and we're learning about diabetes, cancer, any type of disease, at the end of that presentation, we'll typically see a slide that looks similar to this that shows that Black, Latinx, and usually Indigenous folks are those who die disproportionately or suffer disproportionately from certain diseases. And then usually that's where the conversation stops. The professor might say something to the tone of, oh, we're doing our best, um, we're, we're, we're trying to get to the bottom of this, um, but clearly these disparities continue to exist and that's the end of the conversation. But that's extremely problematic because what ends up happening is that white students can look at this data, non-black students or non-students of color can look at this data and they can think that these communities are inherently damaged, that the black body is inherently damaged because they're constantly seeing this data over and over again with no explanation. So if we really seek to do anti-racism work in medical education, we need to look at the way that we're presenting statistics and we have to make sure the context surrounds the, the statistics that we are presenting. Next slide, please. So the other issue is race-based medicine. Um, I pulled this image right off of the American Heart Association. And it said that, it answered the question, why so many African-Americans have high blood pressure? And it said the theories include high rates of obesity and diabetes among African-Americans. And then it also goes on to say that there may be a gene that makes African-Americans much more salt sensitive. And when we see data like this, it can only just perpetuate racism in medicine. Because what we're saying, once again, is that Black people are inherently damaged, 
they have obesity, they have diabetes, because that's just the way that they were born. That's the way that they are. But we know that not to be true. We know that there are food deserts. We know that there was a history of redlining, and there's a lack of access to housing, education, and basic resources that are the true drivers behind these things that we see. But when we look at pages like the American Heart Association, which is supposed to be the pinnacle of, of getting good medical information, that is extremely problematic. And then even if we look, up, look at the way that we're taught about spirometry, and, and I, I remember I was so surprised to learn that when I asked the, to look at a patient's lung function, um, that there was a, a particular equation difference for black patients. And you see it again with GFR. And there's just all of these different ways that race comes up in medicine. And it is perpetuating this idea that black people are inherently damaged and it's extremely problematic and this is something that we must change and this is this brings me to uh, my fourth point next slide please and that is the fear and fatigue issue so all of these different things that i brought up the lack of representation the fact that we're presenting statistics in a problematic way in race-based medicine the onus is often put on students of color black students to bring up these issues so when I talked about the story about the white skin and the Lyme disease. The person that raised their hand was a black student. And when a student has to put themselves out there in that kind of a way, they don't know how that professor is gonna to respond to them. They might respond negatively because they feel like the student is attacking them or calling them a racist and they might feel a way about it. And, and that then puts that student in an uncomfortable position. So then that student might then go to one of the 2% of associate professors in medicine who are black and tell that professor, this is an experience that I had. And that same professor might have had to deal with five, six, seven microaggressions in that same day. So what all that does is it puts so much pressure on black students and black faculty and it creates this fear and fatigue issue. We are afraid to speak out because we don't know how people are gonna respond. We don't know how white fragility is gonna present that day. And then on top of that, we're putting too much pressure on black faculty to have to help students deal with these challenging experiences. And then that is the reason why Dr. Uche Blackstock felt the need to write this piece. Why black doctors like me are leaving faculty positions in academic medical centers? Because we're not having the real conversations. And when we do, we are at fear of, of having repercussions and, and fear that it's gonna harm us. And finally, my last point, next slide, please. The buy-in issue. So all of these things that I've, I've talked about today, these conversations have been had for years. Um, and I feel so honored to be able to present these ideas and these, and these challenges that we've been having. But I stand on the shoulders of giants. There are so many people who have brought this to the attention of professors and administrators. And I just wanted to highlight some of the examples of how this has been done. Uh, recently, recently, the University of Washington, uh, the medical school decided that they were going to exclude race from calculation of EGFR. And that was largely led by the work of students. Um, and then additionally, um, some colleagues of mine, of mine at Harvard Medical School, um, they created a toolkit for medical and dental students addressing microaggressions and dis discrimination on the wards. And then I have a friend out of the, out of UCSF Medical School um, who recently created an Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine. And these are all great initiatives that have been started primarily by medical students. And the reason why I say this is, this is amazing work that they're doing, but we have a buy-in issue. All of this work has been driven by medical students, and we're also expected to be excellent scholars. We're also expected to make sure that our research is on point. There's all of these different ways that we were expected to excel, and we're also expected to do the work of anti-racism on the behalf of institutions when that is the work that they should be doing themselves. So it's time for medical educators to decide that this is something that they're committed to, and if that, if that students are gonna lead these changes, that they need to be compensated with course credit, with uh, financial incentives, scholarships, or something. Because honestly, we are fatigued and we are tired and it's simply unjust. And my last slide was just a thank you slide. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys so much for listening to everything that I had to say. And I look forward to, to dialoguing more about this. Thank you, Asaya, thank you. We started with coalition building and then talked about the public health and racism crisis of COVID. And we really appreciate how you managed to bring this home to our front yard in medical education. Next up is Neil Kalman. Dr. Neil Kalman will talk about segregated care in America. 
Wow, I, I, I am just, uh, I'm totally humbled by the, by the speakers that came before me. Um, I'm a family physician. Um, I run an organization called the Institute for Family Health, which is affiliated with Mount Sinai. It's a network of community health centers. Um, I've been doing work on systemic racism since medical school, which you can tell by my hair is a long time ago. Um, it also makes it very difficult to say something um, really constructive in 10 minutes. But I want to do is give you a brief background on how structural racism functions in academic medical centers in New York City and in their affiliated teaching hospitals and leave you with three action items that you can start working on immediately. Next slide, please. What I'm talking about is equity. Equity means equal opportunity, not just for health care, but for health. And I'm well aware that health goes far beyond health care, but I always think of health care as our little corner of the universe. And if we can get equity right in health care, then maybe we can branch out and start working more broadly with other social determinants of poor health. Next slide. So let me start out by saying that in health care, the foundation of racism is separation or segregation of patients. We don't do that based on signs that say black and white anymore but we use a surrogate me method of discrimination, which is based on the type of insurance people have, knowing well that in New York City and in many other urban areas, people of color are much more likely to be covered by Medicaid or to be uninsured. Next slide. This graph, each line is a hospital in New York City. The little blue arrows at the top are the public hospitals. The horizontal line across the middle is the percentage of the New York City population that is either um, uninsured or covered by Medicaid. All of the academic medical centers are in the bottom 10 on that slide, which means they vastly underserve people of color in our community, represented by the fact that people of color are more likely to be uninsured and on Medicaid. Also, all of the specialty hospitals, the surgical hospital, the only dedicated hospice, the, our cancer hospital, all of them are in the bottom 10 on, on this slide. And all the public hospitals are up on the upper right. Next slide, please. So how does this work in New York? Well, we have public hospitals and private hospitals that are right next door to each other. Um, Montefiore Moses and NCB, Montefiore Weiler and Jacoby, Bellevue and NYU, Mount Sinai, next to Harlem and Metropolitan. Um, look at the difference in the payer mix, the, the size of the bar, or the number of Medicaid and uninsured patients. How is it that we can have two institutions blocks away from each other, sometimes on the same block, that have such incredibly disparate populations of people? How is it that that happens? So we, we have structures that really keep people separate um, in, in New York City. Next, next slide, please. But even if you get into one of the private academic medical centers, which you can see is much less likely if you're a person on Medicaid or uninsured, we have different ways of taking care of people. So in the academic medical centers, and we've studied this in New York City, that we have faculty practices and clinics. And we separate people into two different systems of care within our academic medical centers. So in the faculty practices, we take care of privately insured patients. Most of the doctors in the faculty practice aren't even credentialed in Medicaid or in Medicaid managed care companies. So the poor people and the people on Medicaid get to go to the clinics. Well, okay, what's the difference? Well, the fancy doctors, the ones we now call destination doctors, the ones that people travel all over the country and all over the world to see, are board certified faculty physicians who practice in their faculty practices and many of them never see a Medicaid patient. In the clinics, you know who sees patients in the clinics, the students, the residents, and the fellows. If you think about care coordination, you think about after hours coverage, try to call a clinic. What you're likely to get is an answering machine that says, if you're sick, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. And people in private practices are often cared for by a partner in the private practice if they need to be hospitalized, whereas we still have service patients in the systems that we take care of in many of our academic medical centers. Next slide, please. So we built a house 
the foundation of the house is flawed. It doesn't really matter what color we paint the house. The foundation is flawed. And you have to look at structures, processes, and outcomes. So the structures, we have pi private and public hospitals that are separate. We have faculty practices and clinics that are segregated. We segregate patients who have Medicare and Medicaid and private insurance. We have service patients still that are taken care of by house staff services versus private patients, many, many of whom um, are cared for in completely different systems. And then we have to think about what this means in an academic medical center in relationship to our admission committees are the boards that are known to be biased and educational resources that are brought to bear for um, students and residents. So those structures create processes. And what are the processes that we can look at? Translation services, differential access to technology, the expertise of physicians who are taking care of different patients, access to appointments. We studied appointment access. In some specialties, it took 15 times the length of time to get an appointment with an ophthalmologist, with an endocrinologist, um, with pediatric specialists for somebody on Medicaid than it did if we called the faculty practice in the academic medical centers and, and told people that we were privately insured. And we train the physicians in these segregated settings. So for what everybody said about unconscious bias training and everything else, we basically show people that it's okay to take care of people differently. That's where we're teaching the next generation of physicians and nurses and healthcare administrators. So what are the outcomes? All of the graphs on excess morbidity, uncontrolled chronic illnesses, excess mortality, the graphs that show that people don't seek healthcare in our centers because they don't trust the healthcare center, that they delay treatment. And that all of that is the setting in which we are training the next generation of providers. Next slide. So I told you I would give you three things that you can take home and do immediately. Number one, next slide. We have to end segregated care. We can't teach the next generation of folks. We can't take care of patients in a non-racist way in a setting that has racism in its core. We have to require that all medical school affiliated practices have to accept Medicaid and the uninsured in taking care of people in the same facilities, in the same rooms, at the same time, with the same staff. If we don't do that, we're just perpetuating the structure of segregated care and racism in our institutions. Next. We have to collect race, ethnicity, and language data on all patients in all care settings. Why do I say that? Next slide. Because it's not just enough to collect it. We have to report on processes in our institutions and on outcome metrics. So all of us are reporting on outcomes all of the time, surgical outcomes, ambulatory care outcomes, the percentage of our patients whose A1Cs are less than eight, we report on metrics all the time. If we don't report on those metrics by race and ethnicity, we don't know whether the people that we're taking care of have the same outcomes. And I will tell you every time we study this, people don't have the same outcomes. That's what those graphs that you just saw show. And those graphs, you could put any label at the top of those graphs, they would always look the same. And what they show are, are, are the effects of a racist, structurally racist system on what happens to people. And we, we should be in healthcare, the shelter that people seek from all of the things that are happening in the community, the place that they can go when they have COVID or when they have any other illness, right? Where they're sure of getting the same things done with them. One of the other reasons why we need data is because when we see disparate outcomes, we know where we need to target our resources. So people who have historically bad healthcare or who live in impoverished communities, they don't need the same treatment as I need if I go in the hospital. They need more. They need care coordinators. They need care <coughs> managers. They need help with insurance. They need help with getting the resources that I would have if I went into the hospital myself as a white person. And so we, until we capture the race and ethnicity data, until we report that data, and until we use it to target resources in our institution, we will always have 
the same kind of situation where racism is actually a cause of disparities, even within our health, own healthcare system. Next slide. So structures, processes, and outcomes. When you go home, look at the institutions that you're a part of. For structures, we have to integrate all of the care. We have to eliminate distinctions between faculty practices and clinics, between how we take care of people on, who are covered by Medicaid and the uninsured. We have to make sure that we have adequate translation services, that we collect race, ethnicity, and language data and use the data to identify disparate processes and outcomes. And when we have to look at the outcomes, to direct resources to areas of disparate outcomes and to use the real data to monitor appointment access, electric, elective surgery waiting times, resource use throughout our institutions. Next slide. We have to be the change. We can't just continue to work in the institutions that we're in. We have to be the change and change the structures. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalman. And the final presenter this evening, uh, David Acosta from the AAMC, who will talk about bridging the racial divide in American medicine. Dr. Acosta. Thank you, David. And it's certainly uh, quite an honor to, to be able to join you at the Subway Summit webinars. I've been very, very impressed and very honored to follow all of the speakers, some amazing talks. Um, uh, and it's uh, I'm very humble to, to follow that, but it's also nice to follow a family physician as I'm one as well. So hello, everybody. How, hello, everybody. Um, I don't have any slides today, but I thought I would just basically talk with you. Um, and I'd like to start the session with a recent quote from Dr. James Hildreth, who's the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College. That I think will help set some of the tone of my talk. He said, quote, today we are fighting two formidable enemies, racism and disease. We cannot afford to let either win. We must remember both in our fight. I encourage you to use your voice to direct progress and demand change. This is a time for righteous people and people of goodwill to bring healing to the land. Unbeknownst to many, except for the people in this webinar, I'm sure, that academic medicine does have a legacy of racism. And I'm frequently surprised how many do not know that history or are amnesic for the history or that want to deny the history altogether. But I think if we're going to address this legacy and undo its impact on medicine, on research and the patient care today, we must acknowledge it first. We have to own it and we have to also invest in learning about our history. And it starts with certainly looking in the mirror. So allow me to provide you at least with one example. Today you saw the many faces of how racism manifests itself but I want to focus on something a little differently. And I want to focus on the history of the AAMC. So the AAMC was founded in 1896. And actually that was the same year that the Meharry Medical College was founded, but also the same year that the US Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws, a doctrine that came to, we came to know as separate but equal that provided the legal foundation for two Americas to exist, one African-American and one white. AAMC limited its original membership to predominantly white institutions, institutions that restricted medical school admissions to people of color, women, and Jews. But in 1949, the National Medical Association petitioned the AAMC to issue a policy statement that medical schools should be open to all without discrimination as to ancestry or religion. The AAMC Executive Council response was to maintain that, quote, it never interfered with the admission policies of any of its member colleges, unquote, and declined to take a stand against segregation and discrimination in medical schools. It took almost 20 years in 1968 for the AAMC to commit itself to fully ensuring that African Americans and all minority applicants had equal and meaningful access to medical schools. 39 years later, in 2007, past president Dr. Daryl Kirch publicly acknowledged the history, expressed the decision of the past, 
and took responsibility for the association's inaction. Now let's fast forward to today. Um, we may have had some progress and yes, we may have much deeper investment now in diversity research programs and initiatives. But I think as you've heard from our, from our speakers today, that's still not enough. But we find that structural racism is still embedded in and influences our medical policies, our procedures and the practices that preclude us from moving forward. For example, let's take admissions. African-Americans today make up only 7.1% of the total enrollment in the US medical schools. Or let's state this another way. There are 1,540 African-American medical students enrolled in US medical schools today compared to a total enrollment rate of 21,622. Yeah, some may call that progress, I don't. But this represents an increase of only 1.1% over the last 40 years. American Indian and Alaska Natives make up only 0.2% of the total enrollment in US medical schools today. Or stated in another way, there are only 42 American Indian and Alaskan Native medical students enrolled in US medical schools. Now, when you look at the percentages, the percentages say that's only a decrease of 0.2% over the last 40 years. But when you look at the actual numbers, we had 63 students that were enrolled in 1980, and now it's down to 42. And I mentioned these two populations are not in the sense of excluding other groups at all. But given the risk and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, in which you've already heard the major and specific impact that it's had on Black and Native American communities in the United States. And this certainly comes at a critical time when we really need to be much more laser focused on the extreme shortages of physicians that come from these two vulnerable communities and other marginalized communities. But I think it's time that we also begin to think more of a systems-based perspective I think that's what's been missing all these years. And this must change. We see similar data reflected on the diversity of our faculty and our leadership who serve as role models and mentors for our learners and also serve as our researchers and our clinicians for the communities that we serve. For example, underrepresented faculty make up only 9% of the total full-time faculty in our US medical student schools. African-American faculty make up only 3.5% of the total full-time faculty. Hispanics make up a 5.6% and American Indian and Alaska Natives only 0.16%. So underrepresented minorities also make up only 7.4% of the department chair positions and only 11% of all dean positions in the United States medical schools. So this is really only to point out that a focus on enhancing the diversity in our faculty and leadership is imperative for us also to move forward. The definition of and the policies related to meritocracy need a systems upgrade in order to make headway. This has to change as well. And these findings are the driving force that must guide us, the NC and its member institutions, to amplify the work necessary to continue to address and undo the impact that structural racism clearly has had on our learners, on our faculty, on our institutions, and the community and patients that we serve. And this calls for a systems change if we are ever to achieve racial equity. Last week, some of you may already know that the AAMC issued a statement on police brutality and racism in America and its impact on health where we commit ourselves to moving forward from rhetoric to action. And in the statement, I'm not gonna go through the whole statement at all, but we just highlight some of the things that we are calling to action, everybody in academic medicine to come together to actively acknowledge and speak out against all forms of racism, discrimination, and bias in, in our environments, in our institutions, but also in our communities and in society. And we must stand in solidarity with the black communities and speak out against unjust and inhumane incidences of violence. We must take the lead in educating ourselves. Lachey had a really excellent point that it's not up to the students to do this. It is up to us as medical faculty, educators, and leaders to educate ourselves and others in order to address these issues and employ resources and effective tools like anti-racist training, as was suggested, restorative justice practices, and interracial dialogue in as well. So in short, I think it's time for a reframe and consider transforming our thinking in a new way. 
And I would suggest that we transform it that is equity-based. Transitioning or advancing, or, I'm sorry, transitioning to become uh, equity-based leaders and medical educators means this. It means that we have to proactively educate ourselves and study the data before us about the social and historical context of the structural oppression, the experimentation, the exclusionary practices embedded in academic medicine and its history, and the impact that these had had on, have had on our governance, our structure, our policies and processes. Equity-based leaders and medical educators also reject this ingrained habit of blaming inequities on our learners and faculty because of their social and cultural and education background and really change the focus on the, onto assets that the people bring to the table and not focus it solely on their limitations and then leveraging these assets so that they and the institution can thrive. This also means being more race conscious where we intentionally address the entrenched biases, both conscious and unconscious, prevailing stereotypes and any forms of discrimination in our academic institutions. That will certainly require a much closer look at and to critically deconstruct our structures, our policies, our practices and embedded norms and culture and values that are presumed to be race neutral that only sustain these inequities. I think we need systems-based leadership as well. Systems-based leadership that promotes system-based thinking to make the necessary transformative changes as Jeff Young had talked about in medical education and on our healthcare delivery. And we need to shift this paradigm, this paradigm that we live in from weeding people out, screening them out, sink or swim, publish or perish paradigm to one that is a total investment paradigm in the people so they can thrive in our environments. It first starts with a shining a flashlight inwardly and asking ourselves, as Dr. Kamara Jones would have said, quote, is racism operating here? And I would also add another question. Where are those exclusionary practices? Where are they operating here? So would, to advance equity, to advance equity-based leaders, they're ones who develop a system that hold the institution executives, the administrative leaders and medical educators responsible and accountable for student resident, faculty, and staff success and hold the institution to its effectiveness as well. Yes, people cringe when I talk about this because they, it is going to require a major investment. And I'm not just talking about financial, but it's the investment of the time, the effort, the political capital, and having the courage to take risk of something that may not be as popular and that is beginning to have these meaningful solution-based dialogues, which include, for example, learning to address some of the most common threats from the dominant culture. For example, the uncomfortable and vulnerable space of discussing truth, racism, and white privilege. Equity-based leaders mobilize key internal and external stakeholders in order to partner with, including the local community, and not just the usual suspects that are usually called upon, to address these inequities and exclusionary practices once they have been identified. And finally, leveraging that collective intelligence that comes from the community and all these stakeholders and the, having the political will from these thought leaders to find solutions. So to bridge the racial divide will require a lot of things, but we have to be intentional. We, this is a time to be deliberate about crossing that divide and a willingness to explore new ways of thinking can you imagine what it could be possible if we all cross that bridge? The question I ask is, can we? Will we? Well, I also feel that we can no longer afford to be silent and we no longer can afford to be bystanders. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Acosta, for your honesty and your authenticity. And I will say, hopefully for all of us, that we are ready to be that change. Um, we are going to shift to the Q&A. Now, we're also going to be very disciplined about time to be respectful of everyone's Friday evening. We have 15 minutes for Q&A, uh, and then uh, we could talk about this for hours. We will have an announcement at the end of this of ways to continue the conversation. So um, first question, how do we maintain the spotlight on racism? I'm so afraid the light will dim, and we'll be here again at the next Black Life Lost. Jeff, I wonder if you would mind taking that question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. No, I, I think that's a fair question. Um, and, and I think, you know, we have to continue to, to do the things that we're doing here this evening. We have to 
talk truth to power. We have to um, take ownership, I think, as in institutions, <clears throat> um, what we contribute to um, the, main, the maintenance of um, you know, racism and systemic racism, institutional racism. Um, and I think at this point, you know, I, I think this may be a perfect storm. I, I think in, in some ways, you know, the pandemic of COVID-19, uh, along with the current political um, realities that I think we may be experiencing in this country at this point in time, and the fact that, um, you know, it seems like there's a community of people. They're not just black and brown, but they're white and, and um, really trying to elevate the fact that that there needs to be change. So, you know, I think the poll that we did uh, earlier, you know, highlights that there is some concern, but I think we just have to continue to, to push forward and speak the uh, truth. Thank you. Me. Thank you. Next question, uh, Lashira and faculty, how do you recommend actually teaching anti-racism and social justice in the medical school curriculum? Lash, I wonder if you would just give one example, if you have it, of how anti-racism has been taught in your experience, if you've seen it taught at all. Yeah, um, so I actually just dropped a link in the in the chat because um, the med ed portal through the AAMC, they recently came out with a collection of um, different workshops and different papers that have been written on anti-racism training in medical education. Um, I think the best way that I've seen it done is by having honest conversations, not beating around the bush, um, not just keeping it at the unconscious bias level. Um, but I do think that oftentimes these courses aren't taught by professionals. Um, I think that we need to make sure that we bring in the experts when we're talking about racism because a lot of times I feel like students of color and black students almost end up teaching the entire class. Um, so it's important to make sure that we give folks the appropriate training and we have professionals come in to make sure that they're prepared to lead these conversations. Thank you very much. From Diane Kraft. Dr. Muller? Yes. Could I also, like, could I also add to Latria's uh, sure. answer as well? Sure, sure, of course. You know, I, I think what's really critical is we cannot assume people know how to talk about race and racism. Just because we're intelligent people doesn't necessarily mean we have the skill set to have that. So it all starts with, yes, self-reflection, but we also have to understand how to dialogue about this. People of color already know how to dialogue about this because we talk about it all the time. But again, but it's also a vulnerable space for the dominant culture who don't want to talk about race and racism. And for many a sundry reasons have been studied. So I think that's a real critical space. And the second answer I would have too is there's a, the other thing that's really critical is that we need to develop and we're, which is in the process now at the AAMC, um, we have brought together multiple excerpts on uh, who are teaching racism already in medical school but to come together and create a set of competencies that we can hold people responsible to and accountable to, um, and then create it over the milestones along that go along with it. But it's hack, it can't be limited only to the students. We also have to hold the competencies for our faculty that teach our students on how to be an anti-racist, also as well as our administrators and our senior leadership as well. This is a collective whole that needs to happen so that we are all embedded in this and we're not just relying on one group to be taught this and others don't. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. From Diane Kraft, not a question, but a statement. The MCAT is an example of white supremacy, as is, some would say, step one and step two, as are uh, clerkship grades and who gets honors or high honors and who doesn't. So yes, we appreciate your comment and at least I can say that I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, the next question, Anonymous, the burden put on people of color students faculty must be emphasized. Thank you to the speakers for your time and energy, but the job must fall on the privileged. Um, anyone who wants to respond to that, I have some thoughts too, but I want to open it up to the panelists. This is Utibe. I'm happy to respond. Um, so just today alone, I was on a call about my division of general internal medicine about how to address these issues. Uh, around my Center for Health Equity about how to address these issues. Um, and now obviously speaking this evening, um, the Forbes, Forbes actually just published today um, a piece about seven or so black physicians who have shared their feelings and sentiments over the last few weeks about 
how we've gone from talking about the COVID-19 disparities all the way through to talking about how race influences um, our care. And like LaShira mentioned, this is not just a person of color issue. I love the fact that Dr. Acosta kind of called out the fact that um, the job should come onto the privilege. And so I think many of us have shared in our remarks how critical it is for our leaders, deans, uh, chairs, chiefs, et cetera, to be the ones on the front line, not necessarily teaching about racism because they may not have that expertise, but supporting allyship, sponsoring, et cetera, some of these movements. Thank you very much. Next question up, uh, Dr. Kalman, do you know of any private hospital that has effectively desegregated care so that we can use them as an example of how that model of care works? There are many. I'm on the board of a, of a rural hospital called Ellenville Regional Hospital, it takes care of everybody. We're up at the Health Alliance and have a residency program. We run uh, upstate New York at the Health Alliance, the Hudson Valley, it takes care of everybody, same place, same time, same doctors. Um, same staff. New York City is um, one of the worst. As I've gone around the country um, and spoken to other people, New York City is really um, an outlier. Uh, not that not that everybody else is doing it perfectly, but um, I've been told that Boston works a lot better than New York. Um, I don't know. Some of you, some of the speakers, um, come from Boston, so maybe you want to speak to that too. But uh, there are definitely examples. It doesn't have to be this way. Thank you, thank you. Next question, medical students have been the driving front when we're exhausted and paying for an education that is by default racist. Inclusion cannot be extracurricular. Um, and so this is for the medical students. I wonder, Denise, if you have any thoughts on, it's not really a question, it's really a statement, but um, I think it's linked also to um, a little bit further down. Well, Yes, how can we speak up when implicit and explicit retaliations will surely happen? People who need to attend workshops, training conversations do not show up. There's something about medical students leading this and at the same time worrying about the repercussions of speaking out that I think both you and Lash referred to. I wonder if you might be comfortable commenting on that. Yeah, um, I'll start with um, just some general thoughts actually also related to the previous question on um, the burden falling on communities of color, people of color, and some, you know, some ways that I've, I've and, and we've had these discussions at Mount Sinai is that so many students of color, um, you know, spend hours and hours, you know, mentoring, advising other folks. Um, I know I get emails um, weekly on whether reviewing statements or, um, you know, spending time on the phone and, and walking people through, whether it's from, you know, a high school student who wants to go, you know, the pre-med route and how that, you know, they might navigate choosing college to someone who is, you know, actively applying to medical school and reviewing statements or even folks within, you know, medical school and, 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 and while done, I think out of love, it does take, um, a lot of time and effort and additional burden, um, in addition to conversations like these. So, um, something concretely that I think was done that I really applaud is the creation of additional awards for fourth year graduating medical students. That is not only elevating, you know, someone who was a top researcher in basic science and elevating the achievements in people who have been, um, you know, leaders in advocacy, leaders in medical education. Um, so that is how to actually change the culture is by changing the system. Um, so uh, some other ideas that I just thought about is for, for instance, and um, Lash also mentioned this is, you know, can students get stipend for the additional work they're doing, course credit um, in faculty and faculty promotions. You know, I've heard how those are tied to oftentimes, you know, the number of publications that faculty are able to get out and and what about other things that you know the the school values or th that the institution values um you know how many people of color does that individual mentor and support um so just saying that it it if you change concretely things within the institution i think that helps change culture um and 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 also help elevate and ease the burden on on folks of color Thank you. <clears throat> I think that addresses the next question as well. Um, 
Hi, Lash, I agree with you on so many levels. Thank you so much for your honest stories and elevating these critical systemic issues. Thank you for that comment. Uh, just to add, some of these essential workers that were mentioned, I think in uh, Dr. Essien's talk, did not have PPE, especially early in the pandemic, increasing their risks further. And certainly we saw in New York City that that burden fell disproportionately on the public hospital system that, as Dr. Kamlin mentioned, was taking care disproportionately of patients with um, Medicaid or who are uninsured. Um, my classmates and I called our Durham course coordinator to action to include a darker skin prototype for each lighter skin prototype, and she agreed it's a start. It's a great start. For change to occur, white people have to show up to events that talk about race, listen more than talk, and do some additional research. Um, I wonder if, if uh, David Acosta or Jeff Young can give us uh, examples of ways to pull people into the room. We don't need the people who are already the converted to be the only ones having these kinds of conversations. David, you want to take a crack at that, David Acosta? Sure, I'll go ahead and take a crack at it. Thank you. You know, again, I, I think what's very important is creating that brave space for um, for the dominant culture to come forward. Um, I, but I also think the real critical piece of this is also, if it comes from leadership, this has to be a priority. This has to be deliberate and it has to be intentional um, for our leadership to recognize uh, what the true problems really are and to recognize how much systemic racism is thwarted within, in and embedded throughout our institution uh, is really critical. And again, I think they basically have to make it a priority and sometimes even uh, make it a, a part of their performance evaluation to get them to show up. It's not enough just to show up. But secondly, I think what's really important is really kind of to uh, break through the vulnerabilities that they feel and they assume that they have because many of them have not even approached and tried to even um, begin their interracial dialogues and have these communications. Um, as I'm sure I had said, there are some excellent professional companies that have been doing this work for 28 to 30 years, and they know how to work with white folks who basically don't know how to talk about race. And again, and that's where it starts. It's the willingness and the desire. I don't expect people to know how to talk about race and racism. All I want is number one, that they acknowledge what they don't know. But number two, they have a desire to know because that's where it starts. And again, I think leadership plays uh, a huge role in making this happen. I'm gonna take, thank I you. I just add one, one, other, one other thing. Um, yes. Totally agree, I think David, uh, Dr. Costa nailed it. And I also think that when it doesn't occur, then leadership need, needs to really demonstrate swift and appropriate action. Um, because without that, then it, it's not, it, it doesn't become concrete. And then people will begin to lose faith and confidence that it's of significance. So if you find someone that truly does, um, doesn't engage and do the things that that leadership is basically stating is critically important, then it really becomes, oh, it, it becomes, okay, or whatever. Right, so I, that's the only piece that I would add to, to what Dr. Acosta mentioned. I would agree with you, Jeff. It's about making sure that the expectation is clear. Yes. And that people are held accountable for it. Yeah, Yes. exactly. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So it is 729. I'm afraid we, we cannot take any more questions. Um, we do want to be able to continue the conversation. And while we do that, I, I want to ask the same question that we asked in the very beginning. Slido.com hashtag summit. And on a scale of one to 10, how hopeful do you feel? One being hopeless and 10 extremely hopeful. Um, put your answers in and let's see where we're at. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna let you know that at, at our medical school, um, we've been working on a racism and bias initiative for about the last five years. We have something called Chats for Change, which has been incredibly impactful. And that is what it sounds like. It's the ability to come together with peers and uh, people across the, the whole cross section of staff, faculty, students, um, and across schools as well to talk about difficult topics. What we're going to do, and I'll show in the next slide once people have responded to the Slido question, um, we want to extend that invitation nationally. We're going to launch in July, August, and September a series of chats for change topics. And those of you who have participated in the Subway Summit, we have your email address. We will send you the details, uh, the Zoom links, in term, as well as the dates and the times. The topics are going to be, how are racism, equity, and white privilege operating in my life? The second topic is going to be white supremacy culture. What does it mean and how am I contributing to it? And the topic for September will be, is medical education racist? Um, and so 
we appreciate everyone's participation in this. The distribution on hope um, doesn't look great. We've got a lot of work to do. I think that that the honesty and the and the um, explicit messages we've gotten over the course of the last hour and a half have really helped us to reframe how we're thinking about this. This was not meant to be a feel-good, inspiring finale to the Subway Summit. This is meant to be a reality check. It is time to act, and we are ready to act. Um, and our first act is going to be, as I said, sharing chats for change with all of you nationally and with anyone you want to share it with. July 10th, you'll see at noon, how are racism, equity, and white privilege operating in my life? Because we've got to bring this home. This is not about racist police or the White House. This is about what's happening in my front yard. August 10th at noon, white supremacy culture, what does it mean and how am I contributing to it? And September 9th at noon, is medical education racist? Thank you to everyone, to the speakers, to the organizers, to Tara Cunningham and Leona Hess for organizing this. Um, we really appreciate your presence and we are ready to take on the future.